Welcome back to the Sports Dot interview. Today, we're going to be talking about NCAA sports, amateurism or not. And to do that, we bring back front office sports, the great reporter over there, Amanda Kristovich. And Amanda, uh, I'll tell you what, your story, I mean, you've been on top of this. So if anybody hasn't read front office sports and read Amanda's work and you want to catch up with what's going on here, make sure you go do that. But Amanda, your latest piece really, I mean, for me, hit home because uh, you reported that since 2019, the NCAA and Power 5 schools have been lobbying in Washington. Okay, people say big deal, everybody lobbies in Washington, but this is a significant amount of money they're spending to kind of overturn what we've seen in the last couple of years with the NIL and a lot of the things, last time we talked to you about the Dartmouth case, right? So you look at what they're doing here and they're not just doing it, but they're really going out and using some of the most high powered firms to do this. Tell us a little bit about what you found out and then we'll get into some of the details on what they're trying to do. Yeah, so I basically have been working on this story for several months. It was first brought to my attention. You know, I mean, we all sort of see these quarterly lobbying disclosures that are public that come out, but it was brought to my attention by um, Richard Ford and Casey Floyd, two um, really, really incredible um, minds, I guess you could put it, who started this website called Did You Know Media? And they gave me the idea for this story because they basically found that between 2019 and 2023, the NCAA and Power 5 conferences had spent uh, about $15 million in lobbying um, on Capitol Hill. And that does not include, and like in addition to that, um, they've also enlisted two really, really powerful, well-connected uh, PR firms. Uh, the Power Five has a right-wing firm. The NCA has a left-wing firm. And, you know, the obviously the costs of that are probably in the millions as well, although the public disclosure is a little different there. Um, you know, and so what I found was that it's not just like the money is only the beginning of the story is kind of what one expert explained to me, right? Um, who they are using and how coordinated their effort is. I mean, they are using um, the NCA's lobbying uh, firm also lobbied for Purdue Pharma. They're experts in crisis communications for the big bad wolf, right? And literally the same people um, DYK Media found, like who the actual employees who were lobbying for Purdue Pharma, some of them were also lobbying for the NCAA. Um, on the Power Five side, there are like at least eight firms, um, also some of the highest grossing firms in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they also have really high powered clients, um, you know, like Pfizer, for example. Um, and they are, uh, they, you know, and there's this thing that I learned in lobbying called the revolving door, which is like <laughs> where lobbyists um, or people who work on Capitol Hill go work at lobbying firms and then they go back to Capitol Hill. And so like the NCAA's firm installed um, a secretary of the interior under the Trump administration. And then when he left the Trump administration, according to his LinkedIn, now he's back at that firm. Right. So, I mean, just like the amount of power and, and influence that these people have. One of the firms at the power conferences have all been or have all worked with has ties uh, to Mitch McConnell, obviously a very powerful mm -hmm. person. Um, so, I mean, the list goes on and on. And the PR firms similarly have worked for Uber, you know, the Biden-Harris presidential campaign. The right-wing firm was actually started by a group of Marco Rubio uh, campaign, um, you know, employees, strategists, experts, however you want to call it. So, I mean, these people are the best in the business. And um, the money is really only the beginning of just this sophisticated and coordinated effort to save amateurism. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because, I mean, I think pointing out the money is one thing, but you're right. It's the people and the power associated with these people, the connections they have that shows the seriousness of which the NCA and these Power Five conferences are attacking legislation, in essence. They want to have legislation, and we'll get into that in a second. But when you look at this, I think for people, for fans out there, we'll get to the athletes in a second, but for fans out there, I don't think they think of NCAA. They know it's a big moneymaker, right? Uh, they don't think of it in the same category as big pharma or these political campaigns on both sides. They look at it as, oh, it's it's the local university. Right. But in reality, they're operating just like any other big business would right. in the halls of Washington, aren't they? 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And look, I mean, the amount of money they're spending isn't record breaking. That's what I was told. But again, it's who they're aligning them. First of all, $15 million for a nonprofit. There are laws in this country, the IRS, you know, there are laws and rules about how much money educational nonprofits, 501c3s, right? The NCA is one, the co- all the conferences are one, schools are, right? Um, there's limits on how much they can spend on lobbying, right? And and for good reason, because you don't want all of your, you know, educational public funding to go to, you know, the pockets of folks in Washington. Um, and so the way that they are doing this is is really not, you know, I've been told it's sort of like conducive to an industry as big as theirs, but it's certainly not conducive to a nonprofit industry as great as theirs. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. And then the other thing here too is but let's talk about the athletes because what I found fascinating in your story too was there's this big coordinated effort, which you just outlined for us. Uh, but yet for the athletes now who've been making money since 2021, you called it the golden age for them, right? All these NIL deals. And and we just saw the first lawsuit for somebody who reneged on an NIL deal, which was interesting to me. But you look at this and the athletes themselves, though, there's nobody outside of a few people that you outline in your piece. There's nobody there looking out for their interests in the halls of Congress, right? Right. Because the NCA and power conferences has, have positioned themselves, you know, to the public and in private as the representatives of the athletes when that's not at all the case. And and it's not at all the case, not even necessarily because, you know, I've heard, there's a there's a healthy debate amongst college athletes or amongst the ones who are plugged in. Most of them don't even know this debate is happening. Right. right. Um there's a healthy debate about whether or not they want to empl- be employees or, or what have you. But the NCA and power conferences have presented to Congress this idea that all the athletes think a certain way. We don't even know how they think. We haven't done polling. The letters that they sent to Congress on behalf of athletes, multiple current and former athletes told me that at the very least, they're not representative of mm-hmm. what athletes think because most of them don't know what they think. They don't know right. anything about this, right? And, and couldn't it differ? I mean, Amanda, couldn't it differ? I mean, if you're a uh, star quarterback on a Power 5 team in men's football mm-hmm. versus you're a woman swimmer, you might have a totally different view and have different interests exactly. as part of that, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's very telling that on all of all these dozen, uh, the dozen congressional hearings, you know, lobbyists do help, um, you know, uh, with witness lists and things. Mm. And it's very telling that there was only one current power five, you know, football or men's basketball player on like in total of all these hearings, right? All the athletes deserve a say, but it's very clear that there's, you know, one idea that's being represented and one idea that's not. Um, and I've also heard from athletes that there's, there is absolutely a divide, um, uh, you know, about, if you're a D3 swimmer versus a D1, you know, FBS football player, how you think of yourself and what you think, you know, should you be an employee? Should you not be an employee? Um, and that's not being represented. And and as I mentioned in the piece, you know, the, the, the groups that are trying to advocate, you know, some of them have the ear of Congress. They're, they're finally getting, you know, they, they're getting meetings. It took them a while. It's hard for them to get on hearings, but they get on. Um, they do speak with lawmakers, but they're just like these individual insurgents, right? Like they're not even operating in a coordinated effort. They're kind of all just doing their own one-off thing. And, and that, I mean, really it's, it's very difficult to, to stand up to this coordinated lobbying campaign when, when, when that's the crux of the other side. Yeah. And, and you say it in your story, it's like David versus Goliath, except there's really no David, right? There's, yeah. there's no there's no group that's representing. But I think with work like yours, hopefully people start to wake up and there's maybe some other folks out there with power, money, who will help these folks um, bring their interest ahead of the government. A couple of things that I find interesting here too, Amanda, is the fact that they the, the NCA really, if you look at it, the way you outlined it, three things that they really want to do, right? When they were talking about passing laws and why they're doing this is they want one, an antitrust exemption, which we know a lot about from baseball, not from, from NCAA college uh, sports. 
They also want um, a law that makes college athletes uh, unable to be employees, considered mm -hmm. employees, which we talked about with the Dartmouth case, of course. And then third was to uh, the ability to preempt state laws, which to me, I, like, I read that, I had to read that like three times because I'm like, wait a minute knowing our system and how it works in this country, you want to pass a law that's that subverts every other state law when state laws are supposed to be the interest of their citizens. So it's crazy. When you look at this list of three things they're trying to do, how far are they down the road on this? Have they made significant progress or do we not know that yet? Look, I mean, they have not made progress in the sense that any of these bills have made it out of committees for a vote, right? Um, but they have made progress in messaging. And, and to the fans of college sports, I would say, be critical about the information, right, like the talking points that are emerging from these conversations, from these hearings, from what lawmakers are saying, the death of women's sports, the death of Olympic sport, right? Like, just be, just know that that's part of this coordinated effort. Also, it's part of it to, you know, entice folks who are more liberal, Democrats, for example, mm. to sign on to this in order to protect, you know, these other sports and Interesting. interests. Um, you know, but I think, and I, this is like at the very end of the piece, mm -hmm. not to spoil it, but it's like the, you know, these lobbyists, they're playing the long game. The 2024 election could potentially completely change the makeup of Congress, could completely, you know, change who's in the White House, obviously. Mm -hmm. And and that is going to, you know, especially if we have a more Republican leaning Congress, a Republican in the White House, just based on um, how Republicans have aligned. Um, they're not all, you know, they're all critical of the NCA. Everybody is. But the way that Republicans have aligned recently suggests that it would be easier to pass what the NCA wants in a Republican controlled government. Um, so it doesn't have to happen in the next six months. Everyone's like, oh, it's not going to happen in the next six months. Well, what about after that? Because they've got three, four years of these athletes being employees cases, right? Like the House case is not about athletes being employees. These other cases are. And they're going to be going through appeals. So they've got plenty of time in Congress to pass a law that stops those cases in the interim. And I think like that was what was imparted to me by experts. And that's what I want other people to understand is that you can see movement on messaging. You can see movement on conversation and you can see movement on what even some of the more liberal um, lawmakers, the, how their talking points have shifted, mm. the the bills that they're signing on to that they probably wouldn't have signed on to three years ago. Um, you just, you know, those are indications that there is there are seeds being planted for the future. Yeah. And it's it, again, to your point about the messaging and being patient, they can be patient because there's nobody fighting them tooth and nail on the other side. Right. Mm -hmm. Usually okay. when you see a battle between lobbyists, uh, you know, outside of sports, of course, just talking in general in Washington, you see that ramp up and you see a hurry because they're going against one another. In this case, like you outlined so well, there's nobody really there. Let's hope that somebody does step in and, and try to help these college athletes because uh, their interest, as you said, and, and I think the interests of, for example, taxpayers of public universities who are who are paying for this as well, and they don't even know what's happening. But clearly, right. uh, as I always say, you know, journalism is the it, it's, it's the best antiseptic for some of this stuff to get it out in the open transparency. Right. So we appreciate you doing that. And uh, it's crazy. And we'll see see what happens. But we'll keep up with you and find out what the next domino is. But now at least people are aware, and, and we have you to thank for that uh, from Front Office Sports, of course. And Amanda, we'll keep in touch with you uh, throughout this. And when you have a next update, we'll, we'll get you on once again here on Sports Not. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.